methods of studying culture and psychology. This is the research section of the uh, cultural psychology. Really kind of fascinating to see how people have screwed up. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Okay, there we go. Uh, Eiffel Tower. What should always be the initial step in studying people from other cultures is to learn something about the culture under study. A little bit of knowledge can go a long way in avoiding costly and embarrassing mistakes. And I guess the question I asked you guys is that if you had somebody that uh, wanted to uh, do research on the Navajo Nation, uh, how, would you, how would you help them? get started. Schwader and his colleagues in 1997 were researching family meals. They sought information from rural India and called ahead to optimize their time there. Though people in this area of rural India did not participate in family meals, which is not all that common around the world, an obliging local psychologist convinced a family to sit down at a table to simulate what the researchers were looking for. The researchers happily uh, recorded their discovery and mistakenly included it in their research. And that's what it looked like. However, this is what it looks like in India when people eat. The men eat, and then the women and children eat. They don't eat like that. They eat like this. One can learn about another culture in a variety of ways. The simplest way is to read existing texts and ethnographies about the culture. However, learning about a culture through books and ethnographies uh, limits you to learning about the ideas that, uh, that the author thought were relevant. And, of course, they may be prejudiced again, or for, toward one thing, biased toward one thing and biased against another thing. Another approach is to find a collaborator who is the, uh, from the culture uh, that you're studying and who is interested in pursuing the same research with you. The more involved your collaborator is in the project, the more likely you will get accurate information. Uh, and, and this has, is kind of an interesting concept because a lot of, of what, uh, let's talk about indigenous people. Uh, a lot of what uh, people do, they do they, they can't let other people know about. Uh, this happened up north. <laughs> when they, the Catholic priests came in in the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. They wanted to write a book. They wanted to write a book about uh, the religion and the culture of the, uh, of the Gorvan people, of the Ani men, of the white clay people. Um, so the... Uh, People would tell them things. Now, the problem was that some of the things that they told them were out-and-out -out fabrications. And the reason they told them that is because if they couldn't tell them uh, the, uh, the, the actual information uh, because that was sacred. It was, uh, they had uh, uh, magic bundles uh, that, uh, that held their pipes. They had two pipes, the feather pipe and the uh, it, flat pipe flat pipe and the, and the uh, feathered pipe. And, of course, the uh, uh, researcher, the priest, wanted them to open the bundles. Well, they couldn't do that. Uh, they couldn't open the bundles for one reason. Uh, they couldn't open the bundles because it took a special cer ceremony. It took several days. And, of course, they weren't just going to open up the bundles uh, because then all the magic would be gone. Um, but, of course, these were priests and they didn't understand any of this stuff. And they didn't believe any of this stuff because, you know, they're smarter than the average bear, or at least they thought they were. Uh, so I, that became a, a, a point of contention. Um, when I was there, when I was up there, I was uh, worked on the reservation for 10 years. Uh, when I was up there, uh, there was a conflict with the Sundance. I, I, I'm sure you've... Uh, heard about the Sundance. Um, it's a five-day event, um, and it's to, to keep the, the tribe safe. And the, uh, some of the men pierce and drag uh, skulls, uh, buffalo skulls, um, and 
their sacrifice, the pain that they suffer, uh, that, that allows the tribe to, uh, uh, to survive the next, the next year. Uh, well, there were three of them. There were three Sundances, and one, one of the Sundance, uh, Sundances were done uh, in the uh, Assiniboine area, another one was done in the uh, Rovon area, and they were open to the public. The third one was not open to the public. As a matter of fact, uh, nobody could be there except uh, indigenous people, and that was the one that actually worked. That was the one that that uh, that protected the tribe. The other two, the other two were commercial reasons, for commercial reasons, and people would pay lots of money to watch those sun dances. Um, but uh, we understood what was going on. My wife and I. So we contributed meat to the uh, to the Sundance, but we we were never invited to go, and we didn't want to go because we understood that if we if we were there, it would it would destroy the, the whatever whatever was supposed to happen. We couldn't see it, and that was fine. We understood. The International Association of Cross Cultural Psychology is an organization of researchers studying a culture and psychology. Uh, from all around the world, and its members routinely find members from other countries to collaborate with on cross-cultural projects. Another effective strategy is to immerse oneself in another culture to learn it firsthand. This is an excellent way to gain a rich understanding of uh, another culture, but it can be time-consuming and costly. There is no substitute for first-hand experience. Uh, this is really kind of an interesting picture uh, because so what, why in the world is this lady, uh, did this lady take her, her shirt off? Uh, the answer is because these two ladies had their shirts off. This is, they, they don't wear shirts in that part of Africa. And uh, so she took her shirt off. And, of course, they thought it was quite humorous because she looks very much different than they did. This, I've got another picture of, of a woman with her shirt off in just a second. In 1997... Uh, so the question is, should she have done that? Uh, if, if her culture tells her that she has to keep her shirt on, well, then why would she take her shirt off just because these women had their shirts off? And, of course, she does look very much different. And if she did, was a person that took her shirt off uh, or, or wandered around without her shirt, uh, then, of course, then she would be far more tanned, um, you know, the coloring would be very much different. Uh, as, as odd as that seems, that, that this just seems incorrect to me. Not because she's naked, I, that doesn't, that's no, no big deal. But because she's trying to uh, steal their culture, or she's trying to act like she is aware of their culture. And if she were, then she would know, then she would have to, uh, uh, to, to, to uh, act like people do in her culture. And if that includes putting a lot of clothes on, then, or, and then that includes putting a lot of clothes on. Anyway. In 1997, Patricia Greenfield was doing field research about the making of textiles in, uh, textiles in, in Mexico. Uh, she gave the Zinacantecos uh, women the same survey about their text, uh, textile uh, making that she had used all over the world. Now, the interesting thing is I've been around the Zinacantecos, and I actually have a shirt upstairs uh, that they made, and I gave it to my wife, of course. The women became quite angry when they took her survey. And this is what, they, uh, this is what their, their uh, tops look like. I have, one, I have a couple of them upstairs that... Uh, that I bought for my wife when I was in Guatemala. The Zinacantecos uh, women approached the survey as they would a conversation. When Greenfield asked similar questions, a methodologically sound interview technique, they thought she was stupid or making fun of them, and it made them angry because she kept repeating the same type of questions over and over again. 
Having your methods perceived in identical ways across different cultures is termed methodological equivalence. Sometimes researchers have to adapt their procedures so that it is understandable in each culture equally. And of course, the probability of that happening is not very high. It is strangely not very high. Because what uh, the way you interpret something in, uh, in your culture may not be the way that they interpret it in their culture. The vast majority of cross-cultural research has been conducted between industrialized societies. Uh, the most common comparisons are between North Americans and East Asians. Studying college students from different cultures also lends itself to making meaningful comparisons as students the world over tend to be familiar with, the many, uh, with many of the kinds of procedures used in psychological studies and college students tend to be an accessible <clears throat> sample for the most for most uh, university researchers. So we see a lot of of um, uh, research being done on college freshmen who need the credits. So they'll they'll do a survey or they'll be part of an experiment. And this this is the uh, uh, college students are the most widely used uh, population. Uh, in the United States in, in all this psychological research. Uh, because they don't want to pay people, they, they, they uh, induce their, uh, uh, their students to, to take their surveys and whatnot. And of course, that's what you, I had you do in social psychology. When researchers overemphasize college students, there tends to be a significant problem with generalizability. The research can't be generalized with any populations but other college students, because these are these college students, by golly. So how in the world can you generalize it to a population that's uh, 20 or, or 40 years older? And the answer is you shouldn't. Overusing students affects power. Power reflects the quality of the design of the study and determines if your design is sensitive enough to identify the anticipated effects. Sometimes the hypothesis is correct, but the design doesn't have the power to be able to provide support for it. In cross-cultural studies, culture uh, should always be an independent variable. If researchers contrast two similar cultures, they would not have as much uh, variance in their independent variable as if they had compared two very sim dissimilar cultures. Psychological concepts do not always translate from one culture to the next. Uh, the Japanese ame has no equivalent in English, uh, inappropriate behavior that shows dependence on someone else. That's what ame is. Uh, it's really a, 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 an interesting situation. It's like being, um, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, codependent. Uh, it's like one person is codependent and the other one, uh, the other individual, uh, usually the male, because it's a male-dominated society, uh, the male ignores his, his uh, significant other, and she acts codependent toward him. Uh, she does all kinds of odd things for him. She'll do anything for him. Um, and that's Ame. I don't think I talk about Ame. No, I don't. Okay, I'm sorry. German uh, schadenfreude uh, has no equivalent in English. It's the pleasant feeling from seeing someone else's pain. Why the Germans have a word for this is because <laughs> you see it a lot in the Germans. Um, you know, enjoying the fact that somebody else failed. Uh, if I look, uh, Fago, Fago has no equivalent in, in English. Fago is a mark of maturity that shows compassion for the weak and love and sadness for them. The Chinese have no translation for the word self-esteem. So self-esteem, self, you know, it's a collectivist society. So the, this whole concept of, of uh, feeling good about yourself doesn't exist in China because there is no word for self-esteem. Uh, poor translations, uh, sign seen in a Chinese hotel, please don't accept Strangler's uh, invitation so as not to be cheated. And of course, he's strangling her. They didn't mean Stranglers, they meant Strangers' invitations. Uh, they just put an L in. 
sign in Chinese store, please don't touch yourself. Let us help try you out. And that sounds fairly risque, but it does. It's not risque even a little bit. They're telling you not to touch anything. They will. They will uh, help you look at it. That's what they're trying to say. Sign in a Cambodian hotel, wishing you a, a bong voyage. A bong, of course, is a, a way to smoke uh, marijuana. They meant bon voyage, which is French for a good voyage. Sign in Hong Kong bathroom uh, for keeping toilet clean and tidy. Please dump at the dustbin. What they meant was throw all your paper in the dustbin instead of flushing it down the toilet. That's what they meant. Sign on a Japanese street. When carrying a parasol, please be careful to get in the way of other people around you. They meant uh, please don't get in the way of other people around you. Sign at a Japanese drugstore, we make up prescriptions. No, you don't. You, uh, you fill prescriptions. You don't make them up. It's the doctor that makes up the prescriptions. Sign in the Bucharest uh, hotel lobby. Uh, the lift is being fixed for the next day. During that time, we regret that you will be unbearable. What they meant is they, can't, they won't be able to take you. But <laughs> uh, they seem to think that uh, people will be uh, hor horribly uh, uh, upset about it. Sign in the Paris hotel. Please leave your values at the front desk. They meant valuables, of course. Sign at an Athens hotel. Visitors are expected to complain at the office between the hours of 9 and 11 a.m. daily. <laughs> Which they meant. If you have a complaint, come in at not between 9 and 11. Not everybody has to come in and complain about something. Sign in a Japanese hotel. You are invited to take advantage of the chambermaid. Uh, they don't mean uh, that you... Uh, force yourself on the chambermaid, uh, what they meant was uh, that uh, she'll come in and, and uh, take care of your room. Sign in a Paris dress shop, dresses for street walking. Street walking is, prost is another name for, for prostitution. Uh, and, and this is kind of a curious picture because this is uh, in Germany. In Germany, if somebody's standing along the street and they've got their ankles crossed like this, it, may, it means that they're a prostitute and they're looking for a client, as weird as that is. Uh, it's just really strange. When we were in Germany, we were there for three years. They have uh, brothels in uh, Germany. Not that that's important, but uh, the, and they have a lot of street walkers. So uh, when we were there, <laughs> my daughter would see the women standing along the street, and they'd say, "Why, why are they hitchhiking? Why are they always hitchhiking along this street?" You know, she didn't understand. We didn't try to explain it to her. Sign in Germany campground. It is strictly forbidden on our Black Forest camping site uh, that people of different sex, for instance, men and women, live together in one tent unless they are married with each other for that purpose. <laughs> In other words, only married couples could be in their tents. That's what they meant, but it uh, certainly didn't sound that way. Soviet Weekly Newspaper. There will be a Moscow exhibition of arts by 15,000 Soviet Republic painters and sculptors. These were executed over the past two years. They're not talking about killing people. They're talking about uh, the paintings being done. Sign in a Mallorcan uh, shop here, speech, uh, speeching American. We speech American. I speech American, but sometimes I sound just like that. <laughs> Even for relatively fluent speakers, word choice can be a problem. The most commonly used method of ensuring that a translation is accurate is to have someone translate the translation back into English. This technique is known as the back translation uh, method. Response biases are factors that distort the accuracy of a person's response to surveys, and they become especially problematic when we compare groups that differ in their response biases. Some people will try to seem more socially desirable in their answers and disguise their true feelings to appear more socially desirable. I'm filling out a reader survey for Chewing Magazine. See, they asked how much money I spend on on gum each week, so I wrote $500.
For my age, I put 43, and when they asked uh, what my favorite flavor is, I wrote garlic curry. <laughs> this magazine should have some amusing ads. <laughs> should have some amusing ads soon. I love messing with data. That's Calvin and Hobbes. There is a tendency for people from different cultures to vary in terms of how likely they are to express their agreement in a moderate fashion. Choosing an item close to the end of the scale extremity is known as extremity bias. Choosing an item at the middle of the scale is known as moderacy bias. African Americans and Hispanic Americans tend to give more extreme responses than Americans of a European descent. East Asians uh, tend to be more moderate in their responses than European Americans. East Asians show a greater moderacy bias uh, when they complete the materials in their native language than when they complete uh, them in English. In English, they feel like they could be just a little bit more ex extreme, but they want, uh, they want to comply uh, when they are uh, uh, speaking in their own language. One way to fix moderacy and extremity biases is by having the respondent answer yes, no, rather than using a Likert-like scale. Although it is hard to quantify yes, no answers, and of course that's the problem. There is no maybe, it's only yes or no. A tendency to agree with most statements is known as acquiescence bias and is an issue for cross-cultural comparisons. The acquiescence bias is a total is a problem for cross-cultural uh, research because cultures differ in their tendencies to agree with items. How can you detect acquiescence response bias? Yeah, I totally agree. <laughs> East Asians tend to have a relatively holistic way of looking at the world, and one consequence is that there are more possible truths in a holistic world. This tends to make them see truth in most statements. People tend to evaluate themselves by comparing themselves with others, usually similar others. When we are assessing ourselves in terms of how tall, intelligent, or punctual we are, what matters is how tall, intelligent, or punctual we view ourselves compared to most of the people around us. Referent group effect is critical for cross-cultural research because people from different cultures tend to evaluate themselves by comparing themselves to different reference groups and thus to different standards. Understanding the reference group conundrum, the researcher should always be aware of the reference group effect. So this is somebody from Japan. This is something they're seeing now in Japan. Uh, women are having uh, their eyes fixed because they have uh, eyes that, uh, that are uh, almond-shaped. They're having their eyes done so that they're round, as weird as that may seem. I mean, you would think they'd want to look like themselves, but no, they want to look like Westerners, and they are getting their eyes, uh, they're having plastic surgery on their eyes, so their eyes look round. Now they are round eyes. That's what they used to call uh, people from the West. They called them round eyes. One classic example of reference group effect uh, was a study done looking at African-American soldiers in 1949 while the South was still suffering through Jim Crow. The soldiers were less satisfied about living in the North than living in the repressive South. Could it be that they didn't like the better treatment and the obvious freedoms that they found in the North? With analysis, they found that the soldiers gave their answers because they were using local African Americans as their reference group. Because African Americans were better off in the North than the South, the soldiers' life was more satisfying in the South by comparison. When asked how much uh, people valued enjoying life and pleasure, the results showed that the dour East Germans, who you couldn't get them to smile unless blood was involved, scored the third highest on the survey. East Germans, these are the grouchiest people in the world, but they, enjoy, they value enjoying life and pleasure more than anybody else. That makes no sense. Italians who maintain a lifestyle emphasizing good food, leisurely breaks in cafes, opera, art, and long summer vacations came in next to last on the enjoying life and pleasure scale. Now, this makes absolutely no sense. What's going on? The Ger East Germans are one thing, and the, and the Italians are something uh, 
you know, Italians, they, they have a good time no matter where they are. East Germans never have a good time, so why in the world is this? On the humility scale, the arrogant Americans scored higher on the scale than the humble Chinese. The collectivist Chinese scored higher on the choosing one's own goals scale than the individualistic Americans. Americans always choose their own goals, so why in the world would they score so low? The deprivation effect involves people valuing things they have little uh, of rather than what they have in, in abundance. Thus, since there is a dearth of humbleness among Americans, they value humility more than the Chinese who are taught humility from birth. Subjective self-report measures work fine within cultures because cultural members tend to share the same response biases and reference groups. But subjective self-report measures do not work well between cultures because the members have different response styles and reference groups. Cross-cultural studies are possible, but one variable that cannot be manipulated is cultural background. The comparisons of cultures are not true experiments, but quasi-experiments. Culture cannot be controlled, but other independent variables can. <clears throat> After randomly assigning subjects to groups, a researcher can administer different levels of the independent variable to each group. Any differences in their responses or behaviors that are observed must be due to the independent variable as this is the only thing that differs systematically between the experimental conditions. A second method of doing cross-cultural research is within group manipulation. Each participant receives more than one level of the independent variable. Within group manipulation does not require random assignment because each participant receives each level of the independent variable. Each participant also acts as their own control. Past research has explored cultural messages in domains as diverse as magazine uh, advertisements. Uh, and this is a baby uh, suckling on his mother's breast and holding an Oreo cookie. This is an Oreo cookie advertisement from Korea, as interesting as that is. Now, of course, this would not be acceptable in the United States. Past research has explored cultural messages in domains as diverse as laws. China passed a law in 2013 that adult children must visit their parents often, but they didn't define what often was. <laughs> Past research has explored cultural messages in domains as diverse as newspaper articles. Most headlines around the world were about President Trump's inauguration, but from uh, the country's, that country's point of view, and this was in, uh, in, uh, tw in 2017, of course. Past research has explored cultural messages in domains as diverse as fairy tales. The oldest written fairy tale is Abdullah the Fisherman and Abdullah the Merman, written in 8, 850 AD in Persia. Past research has explored cultural messages and domains as diverse as children's stories. And this is a children's story. This is a child's story from India. Past research has explored cultural messages and domains as diverse as sports coverage. And this, of course, is messy. And Michael Jordan. And that's Usain Bolt. And that's the U.S. winning. Uh, gold medal in uh, ho ice hockey in 19. How was, where was I? I was in Germany when that happened. Uh, 1980? Past research has explored cultural messages and domains as diverse as personal ads. This is an uptown girl. She enjoys a good book, a tasty wine, and a stimulating conversation. Is... 150, I don't understand, for sophisticated fun. I don't know. Past research has explored cultural messages in domains as diverse as web pages. This is a uh, Chinese web page. A key point to realize about research is that no single study is perfect. 
every study has potential methodological shortcomings or alternative theoretical ex explanations. One important skill that uh, students learn in graduate school in psychology is precisely how to come up with alternative explanations for virtually any study they encounter. In science, researchers and readers of research use the principle of Occam's razor uh, to help with determining the, the quality of the research. Occam's razor states that any theory should make as few assumptions as possible, shaving off any extraneous assumptions. All else held uh, equal, Occam's razor maintains that the simpler the theory is more correct. Following Occam's razor, a single explanation is more pers parsimonious and more likely to be correct than four separate explanations. And that's Occam's razor. Occam was a Turkish uh, researcher. Research has always shown that South, the South is the most violent region in the United States and that this has been true since the very founding of the nation. This was according to de Tocqueville in 1835. While violence exists in other regions of the country, the Old West, the South, uh, such as the Old West, where you know gunfights are very common, the South has led the nation in lynchings, sniper attacks, feuds, homicides, and duels. And of course, uh, just, it was just a couple of weeks ago that they had the school shooting in uh, uh, Winder, uh, Georgia, where the kid brought his his AR-15 style rifle in and, and uh, shot 14 people, or 13 people, killed four of them. 14 year old. Andrew Jackson, the tw who's on the $20 bill, once killed a man in a duel over the honor of his wife, who at the time was married to both Jackson and her first husband, while she, was wait while she waited for her divorce to be finalized. She was living with Jackson and she was married to this other guy. And somebody insulted her, so Jackson had a duel with them and killed them. Um, Fisher speculates that the South has always had more tolerance for aggressive pursuits. Reports from the colonial days chronicle no-holds-barred fights where eyes were gouged and noses and ears were bitten off. Or purring, where two men uh, held each other's shoulders and kicked each other in the shins until one of them let go. And this is what purring is. As you can see, they're kicking each other's shins. The South has always been more tolerant than the North concerning corporal punishment of children, capital punishment of criminals, gun ownership, going to war whenever the gauntlet is mentioned, Southern high school students are more likely to bring a weapon to school, the South has more school shootings. There have been several theories as to why the South has evolved one way and the rest of the country another. Hot, uncomfortable temperatures, greater poverty, longer history of slavery where there is a tolerance for inhumane treatment. Nisbet and Cohen in 1996 posit that one factor that has led to more violence in the South is that the South was settled by herders, which has given rise to a culture of honor. The culture of honor is one uh, where men strive to protect their reputation through aggression. Herders are more susceptible to violence because their wealth is more portable where the land is more marginal. This, uh, thus, it is uh, important for herders to develop a reputation of violent retaliation to keep thieves away from their wealth, a culture of honor. The sense of honor has to be established before your wealth is affected. Thus, you need to be violent before anyone tries to steal your livestock. And I don't know if this guy's stealing livestock or protecting it. The herder culture of honor is not limited to the United States, but may have been brought here by the Scots-Irish, who made up a lion's share of the people settling in the South. They were herders in the old country. Herders around the world maintain this bloviated code. Looking at archival data, Nesbitt and Cohen in 1997 found that when you compared records of the rural north with the rural south, they found that not only was the homicide rate higher, but when they compared herding regions of the south with farming regions of the south, the homicide rate was twice that in the herding region. 
Cohen and Nesbitt in 1994 next conducted telephone interviews of Northerners and Southerners and discovered that while they had similar negative feelings about violence, Southerners were more likely to have positive attitudes toward defending their families or their honor. Noting that testosterone rises when men are ready to aggress, Nisbet and Cohen et al. arranged for Northern and Southern students to be put in a vaguely insulting situation. He then measured the testosterone of each participant. Measuring testosterone from saliva samples, the researchers discovered that while the Northern students reacted minimally to the insult, from 4 to, uh, to 5 milligrams, the Southern students were ready to aggress after the insult to a testosterone level of 12.5 milligrams from a level of 4 milligrams. So they both started out in the same, uh, at the same level, 4 milligrams, uh, an average of 4 milligrams of testosterone in their saliva. But when the Northerners were insulted, it only went up marginally. It only went up to 5. But in the Southerners, it tripled. It went up to 12.5. Cohen and his colleagues in 1996 conducted a similar study where they forced the participants into a narrow hallway with a much larger person. What they were measuring was how long it took the participants to step out of the Man, Man Mountain's way, a game of human chicken. The situation was set up by either insulting the participant before they played hallway chicken or not. Northerners reacted in a similar manner, where they were insulted or not, 60 inches to 75%, uh, 75 inches respectively. Southerners, on the other hand, stepped out of the way earlier when not insulted. They stepped out of the way at 110 inches uh, because of hus Southern his hospitality. But after an insult, they approached the Man Mountain on an average of 35 inches before veering off. In other words, they were daring him to run into them. That's less than a yard before they got out of the way. And of course, they were culture, cultural honor was at play. So that is the end of chapter four. Talk to you later.